Thank you, Chris. That was really helpful. See, I've made notes and all. Um, so hi, um, this is an interesting setup. I've never done a panel like this, just standing so, just sitting so low and just be like, hello, everybody. Um, anyway, I'm Wei, um, and then I have my panelists here with me, Grace and Adrian, Adrian and then Tim Oxley. So um, you can see I'm super nervous. I don't know why. I think it's something to do with your talk. It just, it's, it's like it's full of do's and don'ts. Um, so, and then also I was like, oh my God, she's covering all the questions I'm gonna ask my panelists. What am I supposed to do? And then I was like, you can do this. And then I was like, okay, so she's covering the do's and don'ts and maybe we can cover something like, just do it. Just like emotional aspect of public speaking and speaking on the conference. All right, so let's get into it. Let's start by a round of introduction, like who you are and then um, what, uh, what kind of public speaking have you done? Yeah? Yeah, sure. Sure, go ahead. Okay, hi. Hi, I'm, you guys can hear me, right? <laughs> Probably not at the back. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Grace. I'm a data scientist at Uber, so just next door. Um, I've done three tech talks since I joined the tech scene. Um, yeah, so I'm here to offer the newbie perspective. <laughs> And I've done a number of panels, mostly at uh, women in tech events like this. Hi, I'm Idrin. Can you hear me? Actually, you don't realize when you're using the mic. Uh, so I'm Idrin. I'm actually a transitions coach and also a speaker coach for TED, uh, TED Singapore, as well as TEDx Pickering, which is why I'm here. Uh, I've spoken at Fucked Up Nights, if anyone knows that. Sorry for the language. <laughs> that is what it's called. Um, and as well as a couple of other small events, uh, indoor workshops, that's what I do the most of. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, I am Tim. Uh, I'm mainly here because I'm married to this lady um, and she's dragged me along. Uh, I, I've done a, a bunch of public speaking uh, and most of them have been just absolutely terrible, but people keep sort of encouraging me to keep coming back. Um, so I've somehow keep doing talks. Um, I've, I've ran a conference mainly because I wanted the benefits of, um, you know, being in front of people but without actually having to give talks. Um, so that's a little tip. Uh, and uh, I started Singapore JS um, with Way a few years ago, and we've been running like ongoing Singapore JS related events for the last four or five years. So that's just a little plug there. If you want to learn more about JavaScript, go to Singapore JS. I don't know that. Don't need that. I'm great. Cool, thank you. So, um, a little bit about myself. So, um, I have been a software engineer for uh, six years and then I recently quit. Um, now I'm just doing full-time uh, graduate studies. Um, and I've spoken at uh, RubyConf China, Taiwan, uh, Red Hat RubyConf in Singapore, and then uh, JSConf Asia. I should not list all the conferences, but anyway, I've done a fair bit of speaking. Um, and then interestingly, I, uh, I also organized a global diversity CFV day, but for Singapore, and I run a similar panel there. So today is kind of like a, a little get together. Um, Ginny was on the panel. Um, anyways, um, so next question. What is your first uh, conference speaking experience, or rather, uh, like meetup speaking uh, experience? And how did you get into it? What was like the biggest hurdle you have to like overcome to get into it? Yeah. So actually, my first conference speaking experience was not that long ago. I think it was like almost exactly two years ago at PyCon Singapore, and um, our mutual friend Martin, who runs PyLadies Singapore encouraged me to to talk about you know something to do with Python and back then I was like a, I had been an engineer data scientist for like two years so I was like who am I to give a talk on on Python right like I'm a newbie myself so why would anyone want to listen to me that was the definitely the biggest like hurdle for me at least uh, but Martin he was like super encouraging you know he's uh, he's like the basically the advocate for like all women in tech, women in Python in Singapore, and he pushed me to submit a proposal. It got accepted. And yeah, that's how I got started. Cool. I think every talk is almost the first, right? I see some people nodding their head. Even if you've practiced it 
20 times with people you know, or your stuffed toys, or like me, my dog, which the, who doesn't listen actually, I swear. It always feels like the first time. You will always be nervous. I'm not going to lie to you. You're always going to feel butterflies in your stomach. And you're always going to ask the question of, why did I put myself up here again? I'll tell you, this morning, I was still asking myself, why did I say yes to be up here again? Who am I to give you guys advice? Who wants to listen to me? All these things will keep coming on in your head. The thing is, you set yourself up to do it, and you'll set yourself up for success. So that's kind of how I go through every single one. Hope that helps. Uh, so in, in 2012, uh, I had some friends who were um, fairly into peer pressuring me into doing things I didn't want to do. Uh, I was going along to a JavaScript meetup at the time. I thought JavaScript was just a rubbish language who would use this professionally, uh, which was good because it meant that uh, if well, when one of the organizers there um, suggested I should give a talk, uh, I thought, well, you know, how can you mess it up? The language is already terrible. Um, I couldn't make it any worse. So uh, I started giving talks, and then uh, I realized that I'd been trapped. Uh, they, he was really just looking for somebody to take over the responsibilities of running the meetup. So I ended up organizing the meetup, and that's also how I ended up doing all the other stuff. Like running, doing the Singapore thing and running the conference. Again, actually, it was the same person who made me... He said, why don't, why don't we start a conference, Camp JS, which is a conference in Australia. Um, and I said, yeah, sure, great. Um, I didn't really know what I was signing up for. Turns out I was signing up for all of it. Uh, <laughs> all he did was register the domain name and <laughs> said, off you go. So uh, that's, that's sort of how I got into doing public speaking. Uh, the, the, main, the main thing that uh, got me into it was uh, I, I found that some of the content wasn't the, that I was seeing in the meetups wasn't content that I wanted to see. So I sort of saw it as my responsibility. It's like I can't ask other people to put, to put that content together. So I sort of I, I tried to create the community that I wanted to see myself. It's the same thing here in Singapore. There was no JavaScript meetup um, at the time. So I thought, well, you know, all right, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and that's how I got into the stuff. Right, yeah. so it looks like just having like encouraging friends or having friends who just peer pressure you into things or just like the pure sort of confidence in yourself and acknowledging that, okay, so this is, this is something crazy I'm doing and then I'm just going to dive right into it. Uh, I guess that, that all helps. Um, cool. Um, so then I guess uh, one thing that Chris didn't, uh, come, uh, cover in her talk is uh, regarding like how do you come up with topics and talk ideas because I think this is a problem for a lot of people it's just like 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 what Grace just said like who am I to give a talk like it's this kind of like dots like do I have a topic an interesting topic to that my audience might potentially be interested in so what are your thoughts on how to come up with interesting ideas for talks yeah usually I talk about things that I'm like dying to say anyway and um, if I talk about them around the dinner table everyone will fall asleep uh, so instead I submit proposals to conferences uh, with like-minded people and those audiences are more likely to be interested in what I'm talking about yeah so um, technical topics and stuff I, I save it for like non-dinner conversations now and submit my proposals to conferences instead cool I think um, I'm going to highlight what Chris said actually earlier, which is you have to talk about something you care about. Okay, it's really not about the content. Pe you sense when Chris was speaking, I'm sure, that what she cares about when giving her presentation. And if you don't care about the topic that you're talking about, you yourself don't believe in it, you're not going to sound any more interesting than the person next to you who isn't. So most of the speakers that I work with when we have trouble talking about uh, coming up with a topic, First thing is, what do you like talking about? That's really just all I ask. Just tell me everything you like talking about. I mean, really, we've got things all the way from, of course, we live in Singapore, food, number one. <laughs> Second thing, Instagram. Third thing, pets. You know, it goes in that order. And then, of course, then you have to help start guiding them. Yeah, but you're supposed to be talking about huh, something a little bit proper. How do we weave all these in? That's your narrative, right? Going back to what Chris said. So if you think about starting to write down and list everything you would love to talk about, if you had the choice to talk about, 
and then how you can weave that into the topic that you've been assigned to talk about if you don't have a choice, I think that would be the best advice that I can give you to try. It's always follow your heart. That's where it's going to go. Thank you. Uh, I briefly cut, uh, touched on this in, um, previously. Uh, if there's something that you want to learn about uh, and you don't know anything about it, the best way to learn about something is to give a talk about it because you know you have to get up in front of a whole bunch of people who you're hoping like you uh, and if you get up and just talk garbage in front of them you're going to embarrass yourself and in, in order to avoid that because you know, I mean this is a thing for me I, you know I like procrastinating um, but the fear of embarrassing myself in front of people um, is, is somehow like it's more uh, you know it's stronger than my desire to procrastinate it's a very strong desire um, so it's like trying to sort of trick yourself into learning something and um, also, uh, you know, you get yourself, you know, get your face out there and all that stuff. Uh, the, the other thing that I found is uh, if a lot of people feel like when they're uh, initially starting to learn something that uh, they're going to be, you know, why would they give a talk about it? You know, you sort of assume that the people who are speaking about stuff should be the experts, but in fact it's probably the opposite. Um, because often what happens is w once somebody really understands a topic um, thoroughly, they end up, uh, they lose sort of, uh, they, they have a different mental model to how you probably are looking at it, coming at, coming at a topic um, as a beginner. So you've, as a beginner, you're in the best position to teach something to other beginners because you've just recently gone through those hurdles and you've probably um, uh, got a sort of a, a a mental model which is similar to how other beginners are. So uh, I, f I often find the people who are best at teaching you something are the people who are just you know one step ahead of you, not ten steps. The people who are ten steps ahead of you, they'll say stuff and you won't understand. So yeah. Cool. Um, so it sounds like just just to summarize, uh, it sounds like it's like gather sort of the boring topic that you wouldn't like maybe your like family won't understand, but it's a technical topic that you think like people from this conference might be interested in. It's a good idea. And then starting from like something mundane, so, like daily life, what you like, and then sort of work from there to, uh, to topics that's related to the conference or something, uh, that would be a way to go. And then what Tim suggested is um, like set yourself up for a target of learning something and then um, just give a talk on what you've learned. Um, those are all very good ideas on how to get started. So I want to go back to Grace for a bit. Um, so like for me, right, when I was working as a software engineer, I had this problem with like, uh, look, I, today I fixed like uh, this styles of this like website and then um, tomorrow I fix this bug. It seems like my daily life of working is very uninteresting. So how, how can I find like interesting topics I can potentially talk about from like sort of mundane and just like uninteresting daily work of mine. No, actually I think those are the most interesting topics that you could possibly talk about to, to me and other like people who do the same thing, right? So um, one of the tips that Chris gave was to turn it into a story. And I love presentations where someone's like, here's this bug that I encountered this is like the journey we went through to like solve this bug. I love that kind of talk. So I think if you can transform, uh, you know, the issues that you face every day into a compelling story, uh, that's super engaging. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess just like something that took you a long time to figure out. I guess you can just like write it down and then try to make it exciting. <laughs> yeah, and like these are the five things I tried. This is why the first one didn't work. This is how the fifth one eventually like got us over that hurdle that eventually fixed the bug. Cool. I think it's super interesting. Yeah. Um, do you two have anything to add um, about that? Uh, yeah. Things that you think are boring about your job um, aren't necessarily boring to other people, you know, unless they're pro also doing the same job. But most people aren't doing the same job. So, like, uh, I always, uh, I always find it interesting to, if if somebody's into their job, actually, that's the prerequisite. If you're if you're going to sit there and talk for an hour about some horrible part of your job that you don't find interesting, nobody wants to hear that. But uh, if if you can uh, if you can talk about something uh, that you're excited and interested in as a part of your job, um, I think uh, people even even if you know that they're not going to understand it, people uh, often will uh, just like a little bit of an insight, a little bit of a glimpse into how somebody else's life is, and uh, that can also open up um, like. Uh, 
you know, when, when you're a kid and people are telling you about, you know, what jobs are available, I thought that, you know, uh, my options were fireman or policeman. Um, <laughs> and that was it, or, or a knight. Um, <laughs> I, and it, it wasn't until, uh, and even in, even in high school, people don't really tell you what jobs are, uh, are out there and what the contents of those jobs are. Um, and yeah, you can you can offer a people a great service by you know yeah giving them insight into what you do, and they you know they might want to you know join you. So sort of just just like a, kind of like an option providing sort of talk. What was your uh, just insight? Insight. Insight. People like insight. Sure. Okay. Cool. All right. So. Uh, let's get into a bit on the content of the talk. So um, Chris covered, like, um, you know, you can come up with a whole bunch of ideas and cut down from there, filtering. But what if I have too little content? Do you have any advice on that? That is usually my problem. So I don't think having too little content is a bad thing necessarily because, um, you know, Usually people will just fill the rest of the time that you're allotted with questions and you just go through the questions. And if there are no questions, then you know everyone has extra 10 minutes for coffee break, right? So yeah, I don't think it's a bad problem. No, yeah, okay. I usually have the opposite problem, which is too much content. Um, although I will say that when you do have too, so much so-called too little content, um, I think you remember when we, we've been told to write, how much do I need to write? How many words does it need to be on the essay? And you would have had at least one teacher who has come to you and go, it's not about the number of words. It's how you're telling me the story and giving me the content. So if you feel you've said everything you need to say and it's what you want everyone to take away with you, you have the content that you need and that in itself will generate the engagement that you need to keep it going such that time doesn't run over and 10 minutes more of coffee break, never a bad thing. Yeah, you said everything I was going to say. Uh, yeah, ba ba basically, uh, if uh, a talk which covers a little bit of content well is uh, a lot better th than a talk which just kind of quickly covers everything that person has ever thought about that topic, uh, which is more, more often than not, that's the type of talks that you get uh, at, at meetups, and I find them to be uh, not very... Um, you don't learn a lot. But if somebody goes into a little bit of content well, uh, and they know it well, they deliver it well, even if it's a short, actually, in fact, I think 10 minutes is enough for a talk. You know, you can deliver a, a good bit of content, not that there was anything wrong with your talk, which was a little bit longer than that. <laughs> uh, but, but like, if, if, you, if, you, if, you can, if you can deliver, um, uh, you, 10 minutes is enough to deliver um, uh, good content, and you know, throw in a few jokes, throw in a few personal stories, you've got 30 minutes, easy, so yeah. Um, great, you cover. Uh, you mentioned jokes. So, what if what if I'm just not funny? Like, what what, what can I do about that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think you signed up to speak at a conference to like deliver knowledge or like share share knowledge or like spark a discussion. You didn't you didn't sign up to be a stand up comedian, right? So it's a nice bonus if you're funny. I don't think you have to be funny. You're still you're still really funny though. Like, Oh, really? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I, I think it's just a nice bonus if you're funny. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Um, if you want to be a stand-up comedian, then that's what you're doing. You shouldn't be at a conference, but uh, that's what you're at. Uh, and being, I think humor is another thing that if you do, even if you think you're funny, not everyone likes your jokes, right? Or not everyone gets it. And personally, I find that a bit more awkward when I'm standing up there and I decide to crack a joke, and I'm expecting everyone to laugh, and I get this. <coughs> See? <laughs> Not everyone was born to be a humorist. Um, take it easy, I think. Enjoy, enjoy the moment. Again, going back to what we're saying tonight. If you care about what you're talking about, you're enjoying what you're talking about, you'll come up with some form of humor, and the audience will give it back to you as well, rather than forcing yourself to create it, and then no one laughs. It's a little bit more difficult to solve. Yeah, nothing is worse than like forced jokes. Uh, so I, I think I read somewhere uh, that like the, the first, the, the last thing you should do is you know, open your talk with a joke because these people don't know who you are and you're coming out as if you're like their best mate and telling some awful joke. Uh, and it usually falls flat and then everybody's just like, oh. Yeah, and, and they don't want to, it sort of ruins the rest of the, the, the talk for them and for you. 
And in fact, I, I've had I had a thing in South Korea. I was giving a talk. I gave a joke. I made a joke, and then it was just dead silence, <laughs> and it completely ruined like the whole talk for me because I was sitting there. I was thinking about it the whole talk, thinking, <laughs> "Oh my god, that joke bombed." And uh, yeah, it can completely ruin it. So if if you if you don't feel like uh, you um, unless you're confident that you can be funny, try not to. Uh, and <laughs> No, it's true. Like, uh, and, and also, like canned jokes are bad as well. Just don't use canned jokes. Uh, if, if like something that you read in a book, don't copy it down oh. and tell it. You know, that's just terrible. It, pe people, people like people being like authentic. And uh, I think the, the the best jokes are things that people. Uh, I, I find uh, things that people kind of come up with as they're going along. Um, that that's rather than sort of pre-rehearsed, stale garbage. Don't do that. Right. Um, yeah, um, I think like a lot of the times it's just awkwardness of yourself also makes it funny. I like there. I had experiences where I, I, I go on a meet up stage and deliver a talk, and then I didn't mean to tell a joke. People were laughing at. It. I was like, "What are you laughing at? You're laughing at me. Fine, you're laughing. That's fine. That means you're paying attention to what I'm saying. So I guess like sometimes it's just like." Um, just go ahead and deliver the talk, I guess, and then doesn't matter if you're not funny. But then um, this, this question always come to mind. It's like, what if I lose my audience? Like, how, how do I like? I'm, like, jokes seems like a good way to kind of get people interested and keep them interested. But if you know, I'm not good at tell, telling jokes, and then how do I engage my audience instead? Huh. Hopefully. I think it's the kind of the job of the organizer to match the talk to the audience. So hopefully, you know, you've spoken to the organizer, you've ran through the talk with them, and it's something that they think will be interesting to the audience in the first place. Um, as for like losing your audience in the middle of a talk, I, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Like that, that, that's like my worst nightmare too. Um, the only thing. I think I can say about that is that uh, I think time flows differently when you're in front of a lot of people, and it may seem that they are, they are you're like losing them. But um, yeah, when when you're in front of a lot of people, I think uh, your perception of how the talk is being received is very different from what it's like on the ground. So don't worry too much about like losing the audience. Just focus on what you came up here to deliver and pray. <laughs> um, I agree with what Grace has just said as well. When you're up here and you're giving the talk, you really don't know if someone's disengaged unless they're sleeping or doing something else that obvious. And I can assure you, people sign up for the talk because they want to listen to what you have to say. Someone will be listening. Just look for that one person for your vote of confidence. And I mean, right now, even as I'm speaking, I'm wondering who's already disengaged. And I don't know, right? You just hope everyone's still here with you. Don't lose heart and don't fixate. I think why we get nervous is we start fixating on the person who fell asleep. What did I do to make that person fall asleep? Okay, this is boring. You've got a whole room of a few hundred other people who are listening to you who want to be here. Remember, you're there for a reason, so are they. And hopefully, it's the same reason. So no one's going to be disengaged or as badly as you think you are. And when you're up here, time flies faster than you think. It doesn't go that slowly. I'm telling you from me sitting up here right now. Um, so I, I'm going to approach this slightly differently. Uh, this is advice for you as uh, listeners, uh, how you can help somebody who's having a problem as a speaker. Because it, it, is, it is terrifying when you look out and you see just glassy eyes and nobody's, nobody's paying any attention. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, does, do people know Sione here? I oh, think, yeah. yeah. She, she's, I think she's one of my favorite people to have in an audience because she's always nodding. <laughs> she's really always into your talk. And, and, and as long as you look at her, you're like, oh, at least I'm connecting with one person. And so this is, uh, this is something that uh, I, I think is uh, really... I, I try to give people, when they're giving a talk, and if I'm understanding the words, give them a nod. Because uh, it, it makes sure that... And you don't have to do it now. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> it, it would be artificial. But um, but if if you if you can um, give people a, um, 
just some feedback that you're listening because it really does make a difference um, when somebody's speaking, especially if they're nervous, especially if it's their first time, um, you know, or, or if you know that they're going completely off track and they're lost, just nod and just that little bit of confidence can swing them right back on, on track. So, um, yeah. Right. Look, look for your nodder as a speaker as well. <laughs> look for your nodder. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. Just look for your nodder. I think that always, like, for me, it always gives me this confirmation that I just need to keep going, right? Um, cool. So, um, next question. Regarding rejection, um, have you proposed to give a talk at a conference but got rejected? I don't know. Have you? Any of you? Well, my sample size is like two, so I don't think that really counts. <laughs> I'm lucky I get. I, I don't do much conference. It's in big CFP talks that I have to submit one. So, Tim, you're gonna save us. Uh, yeah, I, I've I've been rejected, um, <laughs> and and so uh, in fact, uh, this isn't this isn't a very um, good way of dealing with it. I, I then ended up setting myself up so that. After that, I felt so bummed about it that I no longer go to conferences unless I'm invited. Uh, I never apply. Um, so I, which also means that I, I, I literally haven't been to a conference for two years. <laughs> I haven't spoken at a conference for, for a long time. Oh, um, this is a good start. So yeah, uh, so don't do that. Um, it, it's stupid. Um, yeah. Chris? So none of them had a good answer to this. Uh, <laughs> I get rejected all the damn time. And I think people assume that if you speak often that you must just get invited or you no. And and uh, someone at a Women in Code Sydney had a great phrase for it about collecting no's. That uh, they're not rejecting me as a person. I just yeah, I added another no to my collection. Like, woo, that's a good thing. And so you just um, and so one of the things I often do now is when I get rejected, I share it on Twitter. And I have other speaker friends who do that as well because I think a lot of people starting out they just don't realize that oh god my hit rate is like a lot lower than you would expect. <laughs> just wanted to say that. I was going to ask that question. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's 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 good because like if you don't apply, you never get rejected, and if you don't ever get rejected, you will never really speak at a conference, I guess. And as a conference organizer, you know there are a zillion different reasons you might get rejected. There might be another talk on the same topic. It might be that they had too many talks on that topic last year, and they want to do something else this year. Like there are a million reasons that are not you're terrible and no one wants to hear from you. Yeah, exactly. Don't take it personally. Just like it's your talk, it's not you. Uh, I always. As, as an organizer, I, um, you, you do get a lot of uh, talks that you have to reject. Um, and I, I, when you get rejected from a job or something like that, it usually sucks because they don't give you any feedback. Uh, I, I always try to sort of give people a little bit of feedback. Um, so if you're ever in a position that you, you are accepting or rejecting talks, uh, I, I think the, the people will uh, very much appreciate getting some feedback as to why they were rejected. You know, and uh, it, like on, people appreciate the honesty, even if it's brutal. Um, so, and so long as the the reason you rejected them isn't something stupid, like you didn't like their haircut or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, based on your experience going to conferences and delivering conferences and coaching speakers, um, just generally, like this is a big question. Uh, what do you think make a good talk? Everything that Chris just said. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the point she made about stories again is like one of my favorite things. Like, um, I love going to talks where uh, I sit down and people make it like super engaging. They they present the problem. They don't tell you exactly what the solution is, and then you're like, whoa, what did they do? You know, what you start thinking about possible solutions in your own head as well. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, actually one of the, you made me think of a good example of this. Um, Singapore's GovTech team, I think, wrote a really good blog post on like how they track down like the, the source of like the MRT breakdowns. Yeah, so it wasn't a conference talk. <laughs> it's really distracting. It wasn't a conference talk, but um, they, they wrote like a really cool story of like how they tried a bunch of different things and they walked through, um, you know, eventually the steps that led them to the solution. Um, that help them find the, the source of the MRT breakdowns. It's really interesting. Tell a good story. Yeah, tell a good story. Cool. Yeah, I think Chris really covered everything. Did you? <laughs> well, um, let, let me put it this way. Uh, I do workshops on presentations, so I really think giving a talk, a conference, is really like giving a presentation. It's not that different. 
storyline is one thing, and the second thing is you want people to be listening to you. So if pe you want people to listen to you, what's behind you cannot be distracting, as Chris mentioned, right? With the photos, with the text. But when you do want their attention on it, you want it to be readable as well. So that fine balance of what you have behind you, you yourself, what you're saying, how you present it across your body language, I think that's one very big one to look at. These are all things that make a good talk. Okay, even, and this is really, whether it's a presentation, basically if you're telling something to a big audience, that's what I say, okay, your, the attention should be on you. And you want people to listen, so, Put what you want people to listen to there. And sometimes recording yourself, like what Chris said, and listening, would I listen to that? If you can listen to your own talk 20 times, trust me, you're not that boring. If you will listen to it, you can find that everybody else is listening to it for the first time. Okay? So that, should, that in itself will help people to be there and it makes it a good topic. I can't listen to myself. It's, like, it's just horror. I, I just like it. cringe. Uh, I don't like it either. I change it every time. But uh, what was the question? What makes a good talk? What makes a good talk? Makes a good talk? Uh, just be excited about what you're talking about. That, like, that, that's, that it almost doesn't matter what you're talking about. You can be talking about your shoelaces. <laughs> uh, and, you know, oh, God, I got these new shoelaces. They're made out of, you know, polyethylene. And I bought them from this shop. They were $15, but I think it was worth it. Uh, you know, like, see, it's just total garbage, um, but, you know, I sounded excited about it, so it was interesting. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think Chris covered that as well. Like, it doesn't matter how knowledge, knowledge uh, being knowledgeable about a subject uh, isn't the prerequisite for giving a talk. It's just, and it's not even actually being excited about it, just sound excited about it. That's, that, that's all it is. <laughs> And you don't need to know anything either. Uh, um, just sound excited about something. That's it. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Um, all good points. Uh, one thing that Chris did not cover uh, was um, <laughs> Q&A sessions. So a bit on, uh, do you have something to say? No, no, no. OK. <laughs> cool. So um, on Q&A sessions, um, do you think is necessary to like preempt what kind of questions you're going to get from the audience during Q&A sessions or like like w or like what if uh, the audience asks me a super tough question that I don't have answers to yeah so i think it's definitely a good thing to prepare for questions if you're asked the question that you can't answer there's like the standard smoke and mirrors techniques that you can employ such as i will get back to you later <laughs> or let's talk offline. Yep. Yeah. Or you can just be honest and say you don't know. This you didn't promise to know everything, right? You know, you don't even have to know anything about it. You just need to sound excited, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can just say you don't know. Just be honest. Cool. Look at how many things we have said that we don't exactly know, right? I yeah. think we've put ourselves out there already for this one. Uh, yes, preparing yourself for a couple of questions uh, helps. And actually, when you practice it with other people, ask them. Listening to this. What questions do you think would ask me? Um, I, like tonight, I actually asked someone and go, if you were coming to a talk like this, what would be the most challenging question you would ask me? I literally had to ask somebody that question for lunch today. Um, and then when you get a question like that, and I go, okay, I, did, I, I had this conversation really just a few hours ago and said, so I can't answer that question? What am I gonna do? And he said, just be charming. <laughs> the answer I got was, just be charming. I agree. It's, if you enjoy yourself, even if you really don't know some stuff, as what Tim has mentioned earlier, we really are not here just because we, assume, we really are the assumed experts. We might not be the experts. We might just be one step ahead of you. Or sometimes we're actually behind you. We did our research because we were asked to put up here. Therefore, we look like we're ahead of you. But we might not be. So it's okay to say, I don't know, or like me, pass the mic on. <laughs> uh, yeah, questions are hard. Uh, I, I hate questions, especially after, after a talk. Like, uh, usually when the talk ends, like for me anyway, I, I, I'm just like, I want to get the hell out of there. Uh, you know, it, it's over. I've, I've done my job. And now somebody's going to start like throwing questions at me. Like my brain's just not in the, in the right mode. Um, you know, I want to get behind the lectern. Uh, and so the, 
I, I, yeah, I think just deflect. Just don't <laughs> don't answer anything. You know, speak to my lawyer. Uh, it's, it, it's really like. Uh, I, I, I don't I, I think a lot of good conferences these days don't do Q and A sessions because they realise that uh, you know sometimes they can be embarrassing not only for the um, for the the speaker but, but also the person who's asking a dumb question uh, you know and sometimes they'll ask you something which has nothing to do with anything and you don't want to be like you know you don't want to make them feel bad but you uh, it's either it's like you or them. Who's the idiot? <laughs> uh, and, and you don't want to do that. It's a bad, bad place to be. So, yeah, just deflect um, and get out of there. Go home. Yeah, oh, great. Um, actually, I, I have a point to make about this question. It's like I, I asked myself a question. So here I am answering it. Um, so sometimes when I was pre preparing for a talk, I have just too much content. Like I can't fit everything in there. So I'll be like, if I take out this one bit of content, and I wonder if the audience would ask me this question. It's kind of like a trap question. You kind of like, uh, like something like Chris said. You know, you, you see if you have a gap and you fill that gap. But when you have too much content, you can kind of like artificially create some gaps and just like expect them as questions later. And then you'd be like, when the question, when the audience actually pick up the question, you'd be like, oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so you already knew the answer. So th that's another good way. Um, so with all that, thank you all. Um, I'm going to hand <coughs> this to the floor. So do you have any questions for us? Yeah, you can uh, just a quick thing. I, I actually have seen, is this on? No. no. Uh, I've actually seen you do, do this way, where you, you give a talk and then you say, does anybody have any questions? Somebody asks a question and you're like, well, I'm glad you've said that. And then you bring up the slide. <laughs> uh, so then it looked very, it looked very slick, like you, you, you knew exactly what people were going to ask. So yeah, so I that's think that, good, right? that went well. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, have you got like totally blank on the stage? Or um, totally blank on the stage, not having to say like, next sentence just, just doesn't come to you? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so how do you recover from that? So um, speaker notes help. Um, there was this one time at PyCon, I was like, I went to the next slide and I was like, oh my god, what was I supposed to say here? And I took a second, you know, take a deep breath, look down, look at the PowerPoint, there's like speaker notes there. And um, I just like straight up read off the speaker notes. Um, I thought like, wow, I look so crappy, like, you know, I, I must look like an idiot now. But when I looked at the video afterwards, it looked like nothing. I didn't even, didn't even notice. And that's where I learned actually that like time flows differently on stage. So yeah. It's okay if that happens. Yeah. yeah, it happens to me all the time. Well, especially when I'm not well prepared enough. So I'll be like, silence. This is like the worst because you're like, Jesus, I'm not speaking. Mm. And then, but if you just pause and try to think, and the audience don't really notice it. You just like, they thought you're just pausing for them to think about what you just said. My secret weapon for that one is to take a drink of water. It makes you look so classy. Like, I'll just cut my throat to the try. So, have water. And they're like, wow. Like, oh, and then, and then you got it. Like, it, and then you don't so awkward as, like, just standing there. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Drink water. That happened to me once when I didn't prepare for my presentation and I had a picture behind me, just one picture. And I was like, and I forgot speaker notes. I didn't practice enough. And I was like, why is that picture behind me? <laughs> So you don't know what to say, right? So I decided I'll throw it out to the audience and go, so based on what I've said already, mm -hmm. what do you guys think I put that <laughs> picture up for? <laughs> really? And you know, you could do that with points you put up there. I mean, I, you can have a blank screen and go, what do you guys think is up next? Think, think, think. Right? And, 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 so, and you know, actually, if you've engaged your audience, you'd be surprised. They will throw something up and we'll be like, you know, let's see. And then you click and you're like, ah, oh, okay, that's what I was going to say. You're close, almost. Maybe they'll come up later because you actually don't know what's going on, right? There was a time when Mac, I still did not know how to, as you guys can tell, I'm now telling you I'm technically handicapped. I could not actually get my presenter, you know, your next slide thing. So I only have the current slide and I'm like, what's next? All right, let's see if your answer comes up next. You click and eventually it gets there and go, sorry, better luck, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> you, you kind of find a way to build smoke and mirrors, I guess, to deflect it through. So that's mine. Uh, yeah, uh, like w w when I when I get confused about things, um, having it written down, um, like the speaker notes, like just having them there, knowing that you can fall back to the speaker notes and just read them, is is maybe you don't 
actually need to read them, but just knowing that you can if you if your brain just turns off suddenly and you're thinking about a joke that crashed, bombed, um, you know, that, that really helps. And in fact, one of the reasons why that, that Tokyo talk, to Tokyo, Tokyo, that's not the right country, <laughs> Korea, uh, anyway. Um, see, nobody would know. Nobody would know. Um, but um, w one reason why that talk was bad, because the same thing happened to me. I couldn't, f I, I, I freaked out and my, my, I couldn't figure out how to get my, the, the speaker notes to come up without it also showing on the screen. <laughs> um, oh, I and I had, I had, and not only that, I also had, um, uh, I had some language in my speaker notes, so it wasn't appropriate to be putting up on the screen. Um, <laughs> so uh, the yeah, the, so that that also threw me. Um, so make sure you. Uh, I think the the three things are: make sure you've prepared your talk, way. Make sure you've prepared your talk. Uh, practiced it a couple of times. Practice it with your husband a few times before you give it, please. Uh, and uh, also uh, make sure you've practiced like all the like the technical details. Make sure that you know how to switch your s switch to presenter mode. Um, make sure you just 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 practice it because uh, that that, that uh, y your brain can just go into autopilot if you've practiced it a few times, uh, and that's really that's the best thing. Cool. Yes. So in your opinion, what is the best reason that we should give a talk? What's the best reason? Anybody, any one of us should actually want to give a talk. Why shouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. You're just there to talk about what you enjoy. You're just there to have fun. If you take this attitude, you can talk about shoelaces, you could talk about your dog, you could talk about the day you've had, anything. That is a talk. What's a talk? A talk's a conversation. You just have a conversation either with one person or with a whole load of people who are actually happy to hear you talk. And if you try to practice that, and you actually do that every day. So to me, it's, there's no reason to say no. Uh, and, well, career exposures, so then yeah. I go into conferences as an attendee versus a speaker. Yeah. Yeah, it puts you at a different sort of position when you talk to people. They see you as an expert regardless of whether you are or not. Uh, and then I, I picked up this one while giving a talk. And this one right here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's like that's like where we we met. So it, it just go out and meet people of like likely minds, and then uh, that's what I can think of. Yeah. Also, free conference tickets more often than not. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, I, I think that like the number one thing which. Uh, was beneficial like the, the number one thing that uh, made me like have any kind of resemblance of success in my career was giving meetup talks and giving conference talks uh, it again doesn't matter if you know what you're talking about doesn't matter about anything uh, it just it, next time somebody has a problem with shoelaces they'll come and they'll talk to you because you know that you're at least one person that they know knows at least or is at least excited about shoelaces uh, and uh, the the exposure that you get uh, as as a speaker, even if your talk is bad, even if you give a bad talk, um, people you've suddenly put your face in front of uh, you know how many people uh, who most of them aren't giving a talk. So you're already like you already look amazing to them because you know for, you know the, the whole public speaking is the most you know feared thing in the world. So even even if you deliver a bad talk. Uh, you, you're going to uh, look very good in the eyes of everybody in, in, in the uh, uh, most people in the audience. Uh, you, you'll be forced to learn something. Uh, so every time I prepare a talk, I, I end up learning a lot more stuff which I can't even fit into the talk. You know, because you want to make sure that you know the stuff. Uh, you know, uh, over and well over and above um, the minimum requirement. Um, and uh, I think I think that uh, just that that thing that. The thing that you mentioned, uh, the perceived the perception of authority uh, is so powerful. It is ridiculous. Uh, like, I, this happened to me early in my career. I gave a talk about Backbone, Backbone JS, and then suddenly somebody was trying to hire me for Backbone, and I'm like, dude, I learnt it the day I gave the talk. <laughs> you know? But this is what it's like, uh, and I mean, and it can happen to anybody. You just Give a talk, and then suddenly you are the expert. Uh, it's amazing, and you and you're not even. Yeah, it's good. And I think, can I just finish that off with? I think after every talk you give, you learn more about yourself. 
that's the biggest takeaway you can, other than learning about shoelaces, learning about being the expert, is you learn more about yourself, and you'll feel good about it. So yeah. Uh, one one more little thing is uh, the, the, the other speakers at conferences are also usually awesome people, uh, and and if you if you go to a, a conference, and you're a speaker or an MC, or you're somehow involved with uh, the community organisation, like Michael, for example, is a good example. Uh, you know, he gets to go and schmooze with all of the you know, the top pe people in the in all, you know all of all of the you know, Singapore industries, and he doesn't even have to do anything. He doesn't have to show up with a camera. Uh, he doesn't have to give a talk. Uh, and, and so, um, so not only just giving talks, but also just being involved in your community puts you uh, in touch, uh, allows you to network with um, all of the uh, important people that can really pick up your pick up your career. Uh, it, like literally every single thing which has been positive in my career has happened through meetups. Every single thing. I met Way through um, through uh, a conference. And the reason I was even coming to the conference was because somebody peer pressured me at a meetup to come to Singapore. They, they said, we're going to Singapore, you're coming. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, I'm coming. And, and the, reason I, uh, the reason I applied to give a talk was because somebody, Damon Ullman, um, peer pressured me into giving a talk in Melbourne. And uh, this Singapore thing was happening just before the Melbourne thing. I'm like, well, I'll go practice my Melbourne talk in Singapore. Um, so it was all, it's all peer pressure, oh, that's another point. Uh, it, peer pressure people. If, even if you're, if you're not a speaker, just peer pressure other people to be speakers. Uh, no, it's awesome because you, you, cause sometimes that's all you need. If somebody just needs somebody to say, go do the thing, uh, and they'll be like, oh, well, all right, I guess I'll do the thing because even if I screw it up, well, I can blame that person. They, they told me to go do it. It, it absol no seriously it means that you you, you, you can uh, it absol absolves some of your responsibility for doing something bad you, know, you can just blame them so yeah. all right Grace are you gonna talk you have to talk now you have to answer this question peer pressure talk. next <laughs> what are the good things about giving a talk and just be a speaker honestly I was peer pressure in the most of them you have the receiving end of it. All right. Also, uh, one more thing. You can put it on your resume as a conference speaker, you know, as, as credential to yourself. Cool. Cool. Yes. Uh, on a big tech conference, is anyone who can check quality of your talk? Meetups. Beforehand. You mean when you're submitting it? Um, so the question is, uh, I was going to start a conference. It was a big tech conference. and. From my side, uh, it seems that some talks was the uh, level of meetup, not for the conference. So the question is, is the organizer check the quality of the people talk? Is it good enough for the, for the conference? Yeah, so I think more often than not, the organizers will be happy to check if you ask them. Uh, you know, for Strata, there was like a, like a speaker engagement person, right? You could like send the slides to the person and they'll check it over. Um, another thing that's really, really good is meetups. So for PyCon, um, I practice with Pi ladies beforehand. And, um, you know, not only, not only helps um, in terms of getting feedback, but also helps your confidence a lot because, you know, you've delivered it once, it didn't bomb. And, you know, uh, yeah, they also give you a lot of like good feedback that helps improve the talk before the actual thing. Anything to add? Okay. Any other questions? Very good. Okay, thank you, Grace, Adrian, and uh, Tim. Thank you, Grace.